Hello, I'm Francisco Ponce. I'm a neurosurgeon at the Barrow Neurological Institute. And in this video, I'm gonna talk about uh, PARS defects and uh, spondylolisthesis. So uh, I'm gonna focus on congenital PARS defects. Uh, we often see these at L5, which affect the L5-S1 uh, joint. Uh, and a PARS defect uh, basically permits uh, the bone to, in effect, slide off uh, L5 slide off uh, S1, so that's called a spondylolisthesis, and that can be that that slip can be uh, to varying degrees, and this is something that happens over the course of years, and can result in some um, uh, abnormalities in alignment and posture, uh, and some spinal deformity. Uh, the I'm going to talk about the options in terms of uh, surgical approaches and what I tend to use. Uh, some surgeons will go in from the front and do an anterior approach. Uh, another option is to go to go in from the back and fuse everything in place. Many times people, even though they have this significant slip, uh, don't have symptoms of radiculopathy. They don't have the sharp shooting, stabbing pain going down the leg. Most of the pain is more uh, postural related to the back. And uh, sometimes a surgeon will just fuse it in place. And another option is to try to correct uh, for the slip, to correct for the spondylolisthesis. And uh, that can carry some risks, including uh, injury to the nerve roots, which could result in a foot drop. So uh, this is a um, cartoon uh, illustrating uh, the uh, PARS defect. So here's L5 and S1. And the PARS is a piece of bone that's between uh, the facet uh, the, that articulates uh, with the level below. So if this is L5, uh, the PARS is what connects the facet that articulates with S1. So that's the L5-S1 joint, as well as the facet that articulates with the level above. So this is the L4, L5 joint. Uh, so that's a facet, that's a facet, and this is the pars, and the pars is the piece between it. And so that piece can actually be broken in some people, and that's the pars defect. And without that pars, this bone, the lamina, uh, with the uh, inferior facet can sort of be left behind as the verte vertebral body and everything above it starts to slide forward. So here's an x-ray. Uh, and I'll walk you through this. This is, um, uh, again, you see here the bone, disc, bone, disc. And similarly, bone, disc, bone, disc, bone, disc. The nerve roots are exiting the spinal canal through these windows right here. Uh, again, we're looking from the side. And you can see here the slip. Uh, that's the spondylolisthesis. And here you go with the PARS defect. You can actually see, compare. This is where the PARS would be at L4. And you can see that little gap right here which is the PARS defect at L5, which permits this slip of one and a half centimeters. And here is uh, the same patient's MRI. Uh, and again, see bone, disc, bone, disc, bone, disc. And in the canal, uh, where the spinal cord runs, by the time you get to L1, you, uh, the spinal cord tapers off and you start getting nerve roots. So in this uh, sequence of the MRI, uh, water would appear as white. Uh, so what we're seeing here is white is the spinal fluid. And as we go down, you can see the nerve roots coming out. So that's a nerve root. Uh, here's a nerve root. And here's a nerve root. And what you can uh, see here, and what's important to appreciate, is that despite having that slip, that slip does not have the effect of narrowing the canal because of the pars defect. The lamina is left behind. So you have a nice wide open central canal here. Uh, but as these nerves exit, you can see what this is here that I'm pointing out is a disc bulge. You can start getting severe stenosis uh, in the foramina in the tunnels that the nerves use to exit the spinal canal. So some things to point out here, you can see the swelling in the end plates. These are modic changes and the disc bulge here and the disc bulge here. So because this happens over the course of years, sometimes the um, uh, thing's gonna be pretty stuck in place. So there's always the option to sort of fuse everything in place instead of trying to correct it. But in this case, uh, once we were able to get instruments in both sides and loosen up that disc space, uh, I was able to put in screws, uh, fixed angle screws at S1, and then reduction screws at L5, and use the um, purchase of the rod, this is the rod uh, in the S1 screw, uh, to distract uh, L5, S1, place a graft in between the, in the disc space, and then pull back L5 to reduce the slip. So what you're looking at here are pedicle screws here. This is the rod, 
This is in surgery, so you can actually see the retractor right there. And then this little marker here and this little marker here, these are the graphs, and I have two graphs in there. And uh, that graft is basically supposed to be a substrate so that ultimately what I hope for is for bone to grow across this disc base. And here's a little model right there. Uh, so these are the pedicle screws, you can see right here. These are pedicle screws, and uh, this shows a big graft that we actually put in from the side, uh, but it's the same idea, it's uh, made out of peak, it's like bone plastic. Uh, and then there's a little graft that you can sort of see right there. Um, but these are the pedicle screws uh, with a, uh, an inner body graft. Uh, here's another patient. Uh, you can see, uh, you can appreciate in the MRI, the degree of the slip, as well as how little disc there is. It's all been crushed out. You might even, I, I would think actually going to surgery that there might be the possibility that this is already fused. And that would not be able to uh, reduce uh, this, um, this slip. And again, you can see a little disc bulge here. You can see a pretty big disc bulge anteriorly. Again, sort of as things get flattened, uh, the disc kind of spits out. So here's the spinal cord. And as we get down here, we have a little spinal, uh, these, uh, these nerve roots. And again, one thing you note here is how much white there is, how much fluid, spinal fluid. So it's not actually narrow despite the slip. And again, that's because due to the parse defect, the lamina behind is sort of left behind. You don't have that effect of closing off the canal. So that's the x-ray on the left and the MRI on the right. So I, in this case too, we were able to get in, I was able to get instruments into the disc space, really loosen it up, get things mobile so that I could put the screws in and use the distraction between the uh, disc spaces to in turn pull that bone back and obtain reduction of the, uh, of the slip. So we were able to correct for the slip. And the net effect of this is that we can help improve posture uh, that, uh, that might have be become um, a problem in terms of chronic low back pain in patients who've had this kind of slip. So, uh, and this is three months after surgery. So uh, that's my little video. Uh, these are things that we go through with the models as well as the x-rays in terms of uh, making sure that you're equipped uh, to make a decision regarding whether or not to proceed with an operation. Uh, any operation has risks and part of the key in terms of discussing these is to understand the risks, the benefits, the alternatives, and the, and the indications for surgery. And these can include infection, uh, hematoma, spinal fluid leak, nerve root injury, uh, paralysis. Uh, the, um, uh, once you fuse, uh, what I do in surgery is actually I put the hardware in so I fix everything in place, but the actual fusion takes place over the course of months and up to a year. Uh, so my final imaging takes place a year after surgery when I look for evidence of that bony fusion. So uh, you can have failure of fusion, osteoporosis and smoking are risk factors that can contribute to uh, failed fusions. You can have adjacent level disease. And what adjacent level disease is, is that once you have all this hardware locking these joints in place, these joints have been taken out of commission, you can have accelerated wear and tear above the fusion. And that's what we call adjacent level disease. Um, need to go back to surgery would be things like uh, hematoma, infection, spinal fluid leaks. And then with any, op any operation, something catastrophic like death, coma, stroke, paralysis, those are always risks and uh, something that keeps us on our toes. So, uh, and all of this, of course, uh, would be reiterated and discussed at length uh, in a consultation. So.